All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Leo. Again, welcome back to another Learning Labs crash course. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the back end. We're going to talk about kind of like how you can write your own and the basics of it. Uh, some of the common practices, uh, how you should partition things. We're also going to talk a little bit about why it's fun to work on. Uh, obviously, I'm biased in this opinion. You can ask anyone who works in their area of, uh, of development and they'll tell you that their area is the best or their area is the most fun. Um, but back end is pretty cool. So anyways, um, I'm going to just do a quick little presentation first and then I'll bounce over to a code editor and we'll write a really small, really quick back end um, that will support a message board app that I wrote completely vanilla which you should, you don't have to do that. You can do it in React and it's just works just as well. So anyways, um, we have with us Leisha and Matthew today. Um, if you guys have any questions at any point in this, just like stop me and uh, we can go from there. Uh, although with chat, it's gonna be a little bit tricky for me because I don't wanna like create a window for you guys. A anyways, let's get into this presentation really quick. All right, so. The first question that might come to mind is why, why do we even need to make a backend, right? So it's like, we have all these APIs out there that already exist for us, right? Matt talked about the Pokemon API. It's like, that exists, right? There's gotta be APIs for everything that I wanna do. Well, not quite, right? Imagine that you are writing some kind of secure system, right? I'm writing like, I'm writing like a Google app, right? I have to deal with credentials. I've gotta deal with, Google Maps and stuff, right? And it's like, we've talked about storage on the front end and how you can keep things in state and how you can, we briefly, we glossed over uh, local storage as well. But when you're talking about secure things like credentials, right? And authentication and things like that, it's a completely different story, right? You don't want to have any of those credentials remain on your client side um, you know, unencrypted at any point in time because that leaves them susceptible to attack, right? Um, hence the first point on this slide here, security. Uh, another thing that we need to talk about is storage, right? You can imagine if I'm writing, say, Google Maps, that it would be incredibly inefficient if I sent every single possible road in the area that my current client is looking at, right? Just so that way they can render it, right? Um, we want to be able to pull data incrementally from a large database, right? So that way we don't have to deal with, uh, you know, just having huge chunks of data coming into our front end, right? We want to keep the UI focused on the UI. And that brings me to the next point. Well, the point after the next point, which is partitioning, right? We want to make sure that the front end is focused only on making something pretty for the user, right? We, we want to make sure that it's doing some of that light data work. It's maybe turn it, transforming some objects into other things, but we don't want it to be focused so much on these you know, larger problems at hand, right? If I'm writing something that uses machine learning, Google Maps, right? I don't want the front end to be doing all the number crunching uh, to figure out the best route from A to B, taking into account weather, traffic, past routes, right? Preferences, whether or not I need tolls. That's a lot of work, right? It's much easier if we just, and it's much faster if we just send off a request or make some kind of demand from another computer and say, hey, you're much faster than me. I want you to give me this data after you finish processing it, right? Um, and then that's another nice transition into the last point there, which is speed, right? We want to make sure that the front end stays speedy. And obviously, if you're running on a ancient you know, atom processor computer, like a netbook from 2006, um, it's going to be incredibly slow if you have to crunch all those numbers, right? So hopefully that answers your questions on why we need a backend, right, to begin with, because you want to keep all these things in mind as we go through this. Um, so another point that I mentioned earlier at the start of this video is why is it fun to work on, right? Um, I personally work in backend. Um, I, I like doing lower level things, but backend is probably the closest I'll get to uh, just doing straight up web development from time to time. Um, the first point that I always bring up is usually it's bring your own blank, right? So you can bring your own language, your own libraries, all that. So if you don't want to work in JavaScript, you don't have to, right? You can write you can write a backend in C++ if you wanted to. Although bear in mind that may be a slightly different experience than say if you're writing it in JavaScript. 
because if the whole web is written in it, then it might be easier to use it. So if for the most part though, you can bring whatever you want and it's just a good time. You can, you can write backends from almost anything. Um, another thing you get to determine is the endpoint structure. So like endpoints, which I'll go over in a little bit, are where things get done. Kind of like the things that we call, the, the functions that we call from the front end in order to get data back from the back end, right? Um, we get to determine all that. We get to determine the implementation details, um, how fast we want it to be, how to optimize that all, um, and what makes the most sense for the front end. It's, it's very fun. Um, so the last point that I use here is that, yeah, it's kind of like you're writing a library for any piece of software. It's just that it's connected to the internet. Kind of fun. Um, so before we kind of move forward, I want to go over a few important terms that we should cover really quick. Um, just so that way, when I throw them out, right, if you've never heard them before, you'll, you'll be able to make sense of them. And the first one is HTTP methods. But before that, I should probably tell you what HTTP is, right? The Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Um, what that really is, is it's just a fancy acronym that says uh, basically how we communicate on the internet, right? It's how we get resources from other computers um, without being in the same room as them. So it's pretty cool. Um, the way that we communicate is in the form of requests and responses, which we'll talk about in a moment, but at the very core level is the method, right? You can make various types of requests for resources from different servers, right? Um, and the way that we differentiate them is with these big keywords right here. We have get, head, post, put, delete, connect options, trace, and patch. The ones that I'm going to focus in on are get, post, put, and delete. Um, but there are use cases for all of these options, especially I will briefly mention why options exists um, when we get to cores, which we'll also talk about. So any questions on any of that right now? I'm going to take that as a yeah. All right. Or take that as a no. Cool. Um, all right, sweet. So moving forward, I mentioned I was going to talk about requests and responses. Um, so any kind of communication that you have on the internet is done via a request to a server, and then the server will send you a response in return. Now, the parts of a request include the method, the headers, which we'll talk about in this moment, um, the path, the URL, things like that, um, and then the body of it, right? Now, in the case of a response, you'll have extra information in the form of a response code, um, basically just a way of telling the front end or the person who requested the resource whether or not that request was met with success, in which case your response code would be 200, or maybe something a little bit more exotic, like 201, meaning status created, um, or whether it was met with failure, whether that request was poorly formatted, right, in which case you'd get something like, a, I think it was 501, um, or if the resource that you're trying to find just doesn't exist at all. And this is the dreaded 404 that you've probably been exposed to since you were younger. Um, Cool, so just to explain some of the other parts, um, we talked about method. Headers are really just extra pieces of information in each request, in each response, um, that just provide more information about it and what you should do with it. Um, the path, the URL, those kind of terms, really all refer to the resource that you're trying to get, right? The location of it. So you can think of it as like dropping a pin on a map, right? That is your path, right? You're trying to get to that particular point. Then the body is a collection of zero or more bytes um, that contain data, they contain, um, sorry, I got a notification. Um, they contain data, they contain, you know, pretty much anything that you need. Um, most of the time when we're talking about uh, communication in the case of like React web apps and pretty much any API, that body will be JSON formatted. Um, so like a JavaScript object. And um, yeah, you can send and receive bodies. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Great. So here's a request in the wild that I just pulled randomly um, from earlier. I, I looked up a picture of a cat and uh, in exchange, I got a link to Smithsonian right here. So you can see here, I omitted some of the parts of the path here, but it ultimately resolves to image 1317.jpg, um, right? And then this little HTTP is just saying that it, it, it's the version of HTTP, the version of the hypertext, right? Um, then we have some other information like the host that I'm trying to get this resource from, the user agent, which means, the, so these are the headers, by the way, the host, the user agent, all these things are headers. 
Um, the user agent is basically my web browser version. So you can see here it is Firefox. Um, it's running on the on the display server X11 and it's 64-bit uh, Linux. So that's some other info, version 79. And then I have some other headers here like accepting the language, the encoding, um, just information pertaining to if you want to do extra things to this particular request, like say gzip, meaning you know deflate it, right, compress it, um, then you're okay to do that. And then the referrer here is another field that just explains um, where we're actually getting, like who's telling us to get this uh, particular resource. So then the last thing here is keep alive, which I'll, I'll gloss over. Now, when I make this request, right, uh, notice it's a get request. What, what, what's going to end up coming back to us? I'll go ahead and take that silence as a, a response. Yeah, so um, the, way that, the way that this will work is that we'll send this request to the particular server, and then um, what will happen is we'll get a re response back. So in this case, we're just saying that there's no method, right, because it's a response. Um, and it was met with status 200, meaning it's okay. So that went through correctly. Nothing bad happened along the way. Um, and then what we can see here is some extra information in the form of headers, right? We have the date of um, that particular request. Um, we can see that the content type is an image, it's JPEG, uh, that's the size of it, right? Um, and then some other information pertaining to whether we can cache it in our web browser. Now, what this means is our web browser is going to look at this particular header. It's going to say, oh, I can cache this particular resource, this image of a cat, for however much time, right? Um, and then some other extra headers here are like the server that we're getting referred to, referred through, you know, DNS, um, Cloudflare in this case. Um, and then some other extra pieces. I also omitted the uh, set cookie because cookies are kind of important. So um, that covers all of How do you response. access the request to this? How do you access like the, the info that you showed in that screen? Sure, great question, Matthew. Um, I will really quick show you right now. So let's go ahead and open a web browser, which I've done right here. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open up inspect element. Can you guys see this okay? Yeah. Okay, sweet. Um, and then if I go to the network tab, now this is in Firefox, but in Chrome, you'll have something incredibly similar. Um, and if I go to the network tab and refresh, you'll see that I make some requests here. I will get into why this doesn't have a return status um, in a little bit. This is our message board that I'm going to explain a little later. Um, but you can see here, if we click on the particular request, maybe a better example would be like if I went to... Um, you can just go to like the TeachLA website or something. Yeah, let's do TeachLA. So here, if we look on the network and we refresh, we make a handful of GET requests, right? Um, and then we can see the domain that we made the request to, the particular URL or path of the resource, and whether it was met with an OK response. So you can see here our logo, right? We try and get it. Um, everything else was cached, so it doesn't matter. Um, but we tried to get it, right? And then you can see the response headers. You can see the request headers. You can also see our cute little console log message down here. Um, and if you wanted to see the raw request and response, you can go ahead and check this little box here. And that's how you get the exact text, the hypertext. That answer your question, Matthew? Yeah, thanks. Sweet. All right, back to business. Um, so we've seen a response in the wild. Next thing I'm gonna go over is what an endpoint means. I brushed over this. Uh, very quickly earlier. But what it is, is it's kind of like another word for a URL, right? But the difference is that it's for your API or your backend. Um, and an endpoint means that it's just a place where you basically are calling a function. It's where things get done, right? So if I wanted to get some information about Ditto from the Pokey API, right? Then in this case, I would be using the, you know, get Pokemon endpoint or something like that, right? Okay, <clears throat> a few more terms and then uh, I'll kind of go off and we'll start writing some code. So one thing is uh, REST. You'll hear this thrown around a lot. It stands for representation, representation state transfer, excuse me. Um, 
And when it's implemented on a backend, it, sa it is said that that service is RESTful, right? Um, and all it really is, is it's just a handful of criteria that your backend needs to meet or your service needs to meet. Um, the first one being client server. Basically, you should separate your user concerns from the data storage concerns and your server concerns. Um, like we were talking about earlier, just partitioning, right? It's a very natural thing that you want to do with backend design. Um, stateless is a very important element here. You can think, um, if I have a request, right, to a particular backend, and all of a sudden the backend is storing information about my end user client, right? Um, then there are, there's a lot of places where things could go wrong, right? What if we have packet loss along the way, right? What if we have um, state corruption internally in our backend, right? Basically, if we're trying to track information regarding a client, things can get pretty messy pretty quick. Stateless is a key element of REST because that way, every time you make a request, if it fails, oh, well, geez, we can just make the request again and it's like nothing happened, right? Pretty nice. Cacheable, another key element. I mentioned this earlier. You should be able to cache resources or the server should tell you, hey, you can cache this or it should tell you that you can't cache it. Um, pretty natural thing to want to do as well. Uniform interface. Uh, this is a number of sub points, but you can find them all in the readme, by the way. But um, to really quickly just kind of gloss over them, um, what you should be able to do with your particular interface is navigate how you should use your data based on the responses you get from the server. Um, what, what that's saying is you should include enough information in your responses that the person who's requesting it knows what to do with it, right? Um, it's like if I hand you a box, right? You're not going to know immediately what to do with that box, right? You just, you just asked me for something and I gave you a box, right? Um, but if I tell you, hey, here's a box, it's full of the newspapers you requested earlier this week, or something like that, then you know what to do with it, right? Just a way of thinking of it. <clears throat> so last point here, uh, there's an extra point in the bottom right, but we won't talk about that. Last point is layered system. Um, what that means is if I'm making a request to a particular server um, that's supposed to be my backend, right? I shouldn't be able to tell, it, like it shouldn't operate differently if I made a request to a server that just forwards me to the backend or if I made a request directly to the backend, right? Um, basically, if I'm going through some proxy, it should operate exactly the same. Uh, and then the last point here in the bottom right is a code on demand also exists. That's a point that's kind of optional in the REST implementation. Um, but what it means is you should be able to transfer executable code. You don't really have to worry about it. <clears throat> okay, last term before I kind of get to it, uh, GraphQL, this is kind of, this is a poorly formatted slide, excuse me, but um, GraphQL is this kind of new, fancier kind of query language for backends. Um, so like obviously making a request on a RESTful uh, service is going to be dependent on that particular interface, right? So you can think of it as like making a call to a library, right? It's going to have its own parameters uh, per each service, right? Whereas GraphQL, <clears throat> requests are built around a query language, right, in which you basically supply some information about a particular data type. In this case, I said Pokemon, right? Uh, I told you what its name was, ditto. And then I make a query to the back end, and I also, by the way, sorry, I, I give it the name ditto, and then I also provide the fields that I want to get in return, right? Then the back end, after I send this request, a post to the Pokemon endpoint, we'll go ahead and respond with, oh, that's okay, you know, we've got that Pokemon with us, and here is your data. In this case, it's a Pokemon, its name is Ditto, and its ID is 132. So as I summarize here, you can ask for data with zero or more fields provided, and you'll get exactly what you ask for in return. Very nice, it's a very clean language. Um, highly recommend. <clears throat> But we won't be talking about that. Um, what we're going to be talking about is a, a more REST-esque implementation. Last thing I'm going to talk about is cores. It's cross-origin resource sharing. Um, it's a really big mouthful of a term that basically means you need to enable this setting in order to get resources from somewhere else. So if I'm making a 
uh, if I'm taking a visit to the Teach LA website, right, then if I don't have cores enabled uh, on my request from Teach LA, they won't go through because they don't expect you or the, the browser doesn't expect you to demand any resources from outside the origin being the Teach LA website. So um, we'll use cores in our little backend implementation that I'm going to talk about right now. Very neat. <clears throat> so any questions on any of the terms I threw at you guys? That was me talking really fast. All right, sweet. Um, well, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and write a really quick backend. Yeah. <clears throat> so, all right, in the readme, I say something like, enough talk, let's write a backend, right? So what we're gonna do is we're going to write a short uh, two endpoint backend for my cool message board, right? Which currently doesn't have anything on it. <laughs> Um, but what I want to be able to do on a message board is something you guys can probably guess, right? Think about the methods that I talked about um, and think about kind of like how we might want to structure an endpoint, right, for a message board. What are some things we want to do? Well, Leo, I would imagine you'd want to be able to write a message. Yeah, I'd want to be able to write a message. I'd want to be able to put something on that board, right? And what's another thing we want to do? I mean, it's kind of staring us right in the face. <laughs> see other people's messages. Exactly. I want to see other people's messages too, right? That's kind of important. Um, <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to make two endpoints. Um, I'm switching over here, by the way, in case you guys didn't catch that. I'm switching from desktop one which is where our message board is in the web browser, to desktop two, which is where I'll have my code editor. I'm using Emacs, don't be afraid. It's a little scary looking, but I promise you it's easier to understand than you think. Okay, um, and I'm gonna just go ahead and kill those lines. So that way we have a fresh start. So what I have done is I have made a folder up here in the corner um, for my backend that I'm gonna be writing. And this back end, in this case, is going to be um, our message one, right? And what we're going to write it in is JavaScript. I know that I just mentioned that you can write a back end in any language, right? And indeed, you can. Um, but for sake of like keeping everything in one piece for this uh, Learning Labs crash course, I'm going to write it in JavaScript, um, just because that's what we've been using this whole time. It's very familiar coming from React. Um, but if you guys want to stick around after this, I could write this same backend in like another language if you guys want. Um, so anyways, what I've done is I've initted a package. I have initialized a package in this folder. Um, and you can see here that we have our package.json right here, um, along with a package lock. All I did was I just basically said npm install with the save flag. Um, and I installed Express, which is a popular backend framework. Um, written JavaScript for Node, and also cores. Now, you'll remember that term that I threw out a little earlier, cross-origin resource sharing. We're going to need that. Um, you guys can follow along if you want, or you can just kind of watch if you're, if you're coming from home. Um, hopefully, this is pretty insightful. It should be pretty quick. <clears throat> so we've installed our dependencies, and we have zero vulnerabilities. That's nice. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to open up a file here. I've made index.js. Uh, the reason I did that is just because like package.json, uh, whoops, hold on. Um, package.json is like, it, it, I, wanted, I wanted to use the defaults for it, right? Um, and the default file that it uses as this entry point is index.js, but it's not really that important. Anyways, um, what we're going to do is first we're going to include express and cores, right? So I want to be able to create my app, and that's pretty easy. I'm going to just import Express. Now, you can do this. I can barely see under my webcam. Um, you can do this using ES6 imports as well, but I, I'm just using this because it's a little bit easier with, um, with notes defaults. So what we've done is we've included Express. Leo, if you don't mind me asking, so yeah. I don't know anything about the require keyword because we never went over in the learning lab. Can you very briefly explain what's going on here? Of course. So what's basically going on is the require keyword 
it's the same thing as if we were to import everything from a particular library, right? Um, require is just using it as a dependency for this particular file under a different name. So in this case, it'd be like if we imported something as, if you remember the as keyword, um, another name. So in this case, I'm just assigning it the names cores and express as one might expect. All clear? All right, sweet. Moving on, um, now that we've covered the require keyword really quickly, I'm gonna go ahead and create a app. Now, the way that you create a, well, I'm gonna create a backend server, right? The way that you create a server uh, with Express is you just go ahead and call the Express base function right here. Um, so now we have a constant named app, which is equivalent to our Express server. Um, another thing that we might wanna keep in mind is declaring a port number for our particular server. Um, the port number is basically where it's hosted on. I won't get too much into the specifics of why we're using 8080 uh, and why you can't use something like one, but um, just know that it has to do with operating systems. So now that we've declared our uh, server and we've declared our app, um, let's go ahead and just start it up, I guess, right? So the way we're gonna start it up is we're gonna say app.listen and then we can provide some kind of callback function after it's done. Um, in this case, I'm gonna just make it log something like, um, hi mom, right? So if we go and save this and we run the file now, um, all I'm gonna do is just run it with node index.js in case you guys can't see it over here. Um, whoops. So now we're running the server, right? <laughs> Um, of course, if I try visiting the URL that I make for this, which I'll show you guys in a moment, um, nothing's going to happen, right? Because we haven't set up any endpoints yet. So here, let me go ahead and stop running it. So now we're no longer running our server and we can just kind of work on it as we see fit. Um, before we kind of get into writing the endpoints, I'm going to really quick go ahead and run through um, how middleware works. So the reason that I've included this thing called cores, right? Um, do you guys remember what cores does? Or what it's- Grabs is? info from other sources. Exactly, it makes it so that if we're getting some request for that's of a cross origin type, we can handle it, right? <clears throat> so, what we're going to do here is we're going to apply that particular function with the use function on our app here. Um, what this does is it's applying it in the in a, it's applying it as something that we call middleware. Middleware basically means that it's a function that takes a request as it comes to our server, and then it does something to it, and then it sends it forward to the next function that we want it to handle that we want to handle it with, right? So in this case, what cores is going to do is it's just going to take that request and it's going to say, oh, okay, if you're a cross origin type, I, I know what to do with you, right? And then it passes it along the line. So pretty handy. Middleware is essential. And another thing we're going to use in the form of middleware is express.json. What do you guys think this might do? Turns the request it turns the info you get into a json object correct yes what it's going to do is it's going to take the body of the request specifically and it's going to parse it as a json object so it's just going to make life easy for us when we're working with it um, in our javascript right so now that that's all out of the way um the last thing i suppose i should do before we really get into it is i will go ahead and actually make this a whoops I will actually make this a useful console.log. So started listening at port um, 8080 on, and then we'll just say like HTTP localhost. This will be the same for all of you guys. Um, localhost is just another way of saying like the current host that you're on, the current machine that you're on. So when we start listening, um, what's gonna happen is we're gonna listen on port 8080 on our computer, right? Can't be accessed from outside the network. So there you go. Um, nice. Now we can actually kind of get cooking with this, can't we? Um, what was the what do you think the first endpoint we might want to deal with uh, would be? Hmm. 
maybe something easy. Maybe reading a message. <laughs> um, before we make the endpoint, let's just try and implement the functionality. Um, so if we want to read a message, right? Well, we've got to be reading it from somewhere. Yeah. And the whole idea of having a backend is that we're storing all this data somewhere else, right? Somewhere for long term, um, somewhere that we should be able to read it later down the line. Hmm. I wonder where that might be. Do we have any guesses? Database. Yeah, database, right? Perfect. Um, now, in our case, I don't want to set up a database. That's going to take a long time, right? And it's going to require registering for some service and all that stuff. We're going to just use a file, right? Um, same core idea, though, right? If you were writing a production backend, you would just swap out this file for a proper database, and things would change. But whatever. So, um, what I'm going to do is import the FS module from Node. Do you guys know or have a guess what FS might do for us? It has to do with the fact that Node runs on our computer. And it starts with a particular word. File. File <laughs> system, yeah. So what we're going to do is we're importing the file system module just so that way we can actually work with files, right? Um, so now let's write a function that reads some particular number of, let's say, posts from a file. Right? So I'm going to just declare a function here. Um, let's say read posts. Um, we'll just say it takes some count, right? Some number of posts, right? Um, for our purposes, let's assume that all the posts are in an array, right? So what we're going to do is use count to take a slice of that array. Great. So now what we're going to do is use the FS interface, uh, the file system interface, to really quickly um, read in a particular file. So read file is a function that takes the argument of the path of the file or a path-like object. So it can be a string, it can be a proper system path, it could be any of those things, right? It's path-like. Um, and then it takes another argument, which is a callback function, which is called after it reads in the file into memory. So in this case, I have a pre-prepared list of posts over here, post.json. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and give it the post.json path. And then the next thing I wanted to pass it was a callback function. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to just go ahead and write a arrow function. Now, you can't really tell this um, just from looking at, no, stop that. Um, just from looking at it, but what it takes is a request and a, or sorry, it doesn't take a request and a response. It takes an error and the data, excuse me. So if an error occurs, then it'll have a non-empty error. Um, otherwise, the data will be populated with the contents of the file, right? So what we're doing here, again, is using ES6. We're writing an error function. It's just an anonymous function. Um, we're going to take in those two parameters, and we're going to do something with it. So in this case, I'm going to check and see really quick um, let's do something like this, right? I want to read in some number of posts, right? Um, but I want to make sure that if an error occurs, then bad, you know, then I won't read in those posts at all. So let's just go ahead and say that if there's an error that occurs, we will return uh, an object in which the error field contains error, right? Otherwise, we'll return the data, I guess. Now the question here is, what kind of return type should we be using, right? What kind of data should we put in here? We're working with an array, right, which is going to be a list. I will go ahead and steam ahead. Um, what we're probably going to want to do is since data is read into memory, right? And it's just a string by default, which unfortunately you couldn't have known if you didn't look at the documentation, excuse me. Um, 
what we're going to do is have to turn it into a JSON object, right? And we can do that using a function we've used before in this course, um, which I'll just really quick cover. It's going to be JSON parse, because um, I want to just keep us on time here. Sweet. So what we're going to do is parse our data. Um, and then since we're treating it like it's an array, uh, we're going to take a slice of it. So we're going to say it's a slice from zero to count. Nice. Um, so now we have our read post function. So if we pass it some count, it'll read in that many posts from our file, which is a database, it's post.json. Um, nice. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to do was we're going to add a post. So we're going to go ahead and write a function for this too. Um, let's say that it takes in, gosh, for our purposes, um, <clears throat> just a message, just a post object, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to read in our file as we have done before. We're going to say if we get some error, then we should return it. Um, and let's say since we're just creating a post, um, since we're just creating a post, we want to be able to, whoops, we want to be able to just have an avoid return here otherwise. Nice. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to read in this array and then we're going to say parse is equal to JSON parse of this data. So now we have a JSON object, which is an array. Um, just to ensure that we treat it like an array, we can create one from it using the array.from prototype. Um, so we'll just say r is equal to array.from our parse data. Nice. Um, then what we're going to do is just push into the array our new content, which is going to be a post. Um, nice. So now we have this all in memory, but we still need to write it back. Writing it back will be pretty easy. We're just going to use the write file operation to the exact same file. This is looking very gross, and uh, I don't recommend you do something like this in an actual uh, database or an actual uh, backend. Okay, a second. Uh, and unfortunately, wait. What makes this gross? What uh, What makes this gross? Sorry. Um, what makes this gross is that we're reading in the file entirely into memory, and then we are writing back the file entirely from memory, right? Now, let's think about this objectively for a second, right? Why might that be bad? Um, Matthew, like, Matthew or Leisha, Leisha actually. Either one of you, right? Why might this be bad? I'm reading in a file that is going to keep getting bigger, right? Why might that be bad? Uh, sorry, what was that, Alicia? Uh, yeah, so basically what's going to happen is it's just going to keep getting larger, right? And if we keep reading it into memory, then that's going to be bad for performance, right? So it's going to keep getting exponentially larger and then our reads and our writes are going to be, well, it's not exponentially large, but our reads and writes are going to get incredibly more expensive as time goes on if we keep using this file as a database, right? So ideally we would use a proper database here. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, um, we're gonna work with that for now, just for sake of brevity. Nice, so now we have our functions here, um, but obviously they're not working with requests, right? We have to think of this in terms of the language of requests that we talked about just a little bit ago, right? We have to think of it in terms of the method, the body, uh, things like that, what resource it's trying to get, right? So if I'm writing some new API for my message board web app, um, what kind of interface might we expect, right? What kind of resource first off?
Well, first off, we're going to want to actually create some resource to make a request to. Um, the way we do that in Express is with the method family of functions. So off of our app here, um, we can just create a brand new endpoint in the form of get or dot post or dot delete, uh, things of that nature. Since we wanna first tackle the issue of reading some posts, let's go ahead and make a get endpoint. And the first argument is going to be the path of this. And then the second argument is going to be its function that handles it. And it takes two arguments being the request and the response. So as we explained earlier, um, since we're using the JSON middleware um, from Express, the body of the request is going to be automatically parsed for us, um, which is nice, but this won't work in the case of a get endpoint. Um, the reason for that is that get endpoints or get requests aren't permitted to have a body. Um, they just aren't allowed, or rather you can provide one, but it will go into the void. So what we do instead is get our parameters for this particular endpoint from the query variables, the query variables. So if I'm, well, you guys saw my Docker tab. Um, <laughs> that's exciting, I guess. Um, so the query variables are things that are usually tied onto the end of your URL. So if we're looking here, this is our web page. but if I had a question mark, um, say like count equals 20, right? Um, nothing changes, right? But what does change are the query variables. So if I go ahead and I just say, um, gosh, what is it? Window dot is it URL dot query. What is it? Window dot query, path dot query, um, document dot query. In any case, what ends up changing is our query variables. So the actual path to the resource is not modified here, right? Um, it, nothing's going to change on the web page that we end up getting. But what does change is the query. So anyways, we can get those pretty easily um, just by referencing them from our request object, which is another type that's provided by Express um, in the form of rec.query, nice. Um, and then since it's a object, we can just go ahead and say like, let's say we went to expect the variable count, right? So count will be passed over to our read post function, um, or we can just transform read posts into a function, into a handler, and then go from there. Um, pretty handy. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and write that real quick. And I realized that we're running out of time. So I'm going to try and move super fast. Um, something I wanted to mention really quick that's mentioned in the readme is that we, there's two ways that you can really go about writing a backend. And that is one, you can just write the functionality that works with the file system or your database straight into the handler function. Or two, you could write an interface like this, which is internal, um, read posts, add posts, thing like that, things like that, um, and then just call them from your handler. The second way is highly recommended simply because it helps with maintainability down the line. And also, it's just good coding practice. Um, but since we're trying to cut this really quick, um, I'm going to just write it straight in. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and just mirror our I'm going to declare a constant for this. Um, so we'll just call it db post.json. Um, we're going to go ahead and just go ahead and use that um, air data. Nice. We're just mirroring the exact code that we used up here in read post. Um, and then if there's an error, we'll just go ahead and say return the error. Uh, otherwise, otherwise return. Um, the exact same thing. Um, actually, we don't need a return, sorry, excuse me. What we're gonna do is write it to the response. And the way that we can do that is with the JSON function. So there we go. Um, Data is going to be equal to uh, the exact same function that we used up here, which is going to be right here. JSON.parse data slice zero count, nice. Um, so that should work as expected. Um, something that we also need to take into account is the status code that we write. So I'm going to just write it 200 there. Uh, and in the case of an error, we're going to write a non 200 status code. Um, let's just say that we write 500. Um, nice. And then we will also write this in the form of JSON. Nice. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So that is our first endpoint out of the way. Then the next one we want to do is create 
uh, is creating a message, right? So we're going to go ahead and just write a post, um, post method, excuse me. And we're going to bind it to the exact same endpoint because since we can distinguish by method um, of the HTTP request, we can just go ahead and use that. Um, so we have a get endpoint at this particular resource and a post endpoint at this particular resource. Pretty handy. Um, Wait, so can you explain the, the status real quick? Sure, yeah, yeah. So the status code, remember um, earlier when I mentioned um, that you can get a particular status code in a response, right? So in the case of the one that I made to the cat website, right, I got a 200, right? Um, and then in the case here, I'm getting nothing because the host is down right now. Um, but if I go to HLA, and I take a look, you can see here, this is the status. So 200 means okay. 304 means not modified, meaning it was cached. So there's status codes all like that. So we have to write one in order to indicate to the requester um, whether their request was met with an okay response or whether something bad happened. So then does the, does the number matter? Like why'd you choose 500 and 200? Sure, that's a great question, which I actually omitted from my readme. Thank you for reminding me to do that. Um, what the number means is there's particular HTTP code ranges. So let's take a look at the status codes, right? So if we take a look, um, 100 continue, 101 switching protocols, they all have their own kind of wordy meanings that are bound to each of them. Uh, 300 is used, so a 300 range is used to indicate redirection. Uh, 400 is usually when you have a client error yeah, like this. So 404 meaning there was nothing found or you just had a bad request going on, like you're not authorized or uh, what else? Uh, or like gone, right? <clears throat> uh, and then in this one, 500 means there's a server error. So the reason I used 500 here is because if an error is returned from the file system library, then we have something incredibly bad going on on our end, right? Um, it wasn't the client's fault. So that's why we use that. Thank you for reminding me to explain that. Okay. Um, and I'm going to just mirror what we did up here really quick. Nice. And this might, uh, this might not be error free initially, but we'll go from there. Um, I'm going to use the same kind of like minim minimization that I used in my, uh, read me for this actually um, just because it's a little bit quicker to write uh, nice so in this case um, I'm just pushing into this array that we read in from our file uh, the request body directly do you have any ideas why that might be a bad idea Leo what if the thing is really thick or if there's a problem and you can't get an array Great answer, Matt. Yeah, if it's a really, like, basically, if this thing is huge, if the request body is massive, right, or if it's poorly formatted, then this is going to completely screw up our database. So what you should do here when you're writing this on your own or for production is you should actually be checking the type to make sure that it has the fields that you expect and nothing more, uh, nothing less. And you should also just be on, um, basically making sure that your client can't do anything bad to your database. So nice. Um, last thing I'm going to do here is just write another status message. Um, there's an extra line of code that I use in the example, but we won't use that here. And then at the very bottom, if things went through OK, we'll write an OK. And uh, that's it. Nice. So that's our code for the back end. And I'm going to go ahead and remove that. Um, nice. So now we have two endpoints here and a server setup. And if all went as expected, it will run as expected. And now we have it serving on 8080. So if I refresh my message board, when it makes this request, it should be able to handle it because where are you? Oh, we need to get the count from the request. So I'm going to just use rec query count. Um, yeah, I think that should be correct. Nice. So we're going to rerun it. Nope, stop that. Nice. Now if I refresh, 
says get 200, okay. And the response is this JSON right here. So it should be able to recognize that our objects, it should, it'll be able to recognize our objects. And if we send some post like hi there, right? And then the name, I guess, will be Matthew and Keisha. Then it'll try and make the post request. I think I need, did I forget to do? I forgot to do this. So let's go ahead and fix that really quick. Um, what I'm doing right now is I'm just adding on the end function, um, which just chains on to any old uh, express function that tells it to terminate the request. Um, and then over here, this should actually be, uh, oh, there it is, uh, res status 500 dot JSON error, and then end it. And then over here, it should be ended as well. Nice. So if all went as expected, we should be good. Now I'm going to go ahead and just check out the latest version of um, not index doing this posts.json. So that way we have a fresh slate here. Clean. So that's still accept that's still expected, and then we want to send this one, and it went through correctly. Um, and you can tell because it has that OK response right here. There we go. This is the working product at the end. Um, on refresh, what ends up happening is you can see here, it makes a get request. It gets back the JSON object. Sorry, these are all in the way. It, get back, it gets back the objects in an array here from our back end. Then when we create something, it sends a post request used to create with a payload that is a JSON representation of the post. So now if we refresh, you can see that we have the hi there post from Matthew and Leisha. Pretty cool. Um, this is poorly formatted though. <laughs> yeah. So we can make some other things too. But that's probably all that I wanted to talk about. So while we're still here, are there any questions on any terms or anything that you want to know regarding backend that I didn't cover in this presentation? Sure, yeah, you said like how some of the other ones you want to talk about, like the request types were like um, delete and put, but then we didn't use them. Yeah, so I actually think I may have forgotten to mention what they meant. So get is used to get, right, as one might expect. Put is used to, um, oh, Matt's gone. Um, put is used to update a resource, right? Uh, then also post is used to create something. Delete is used to delete something, but it's not actually super well defined. Um, and then options is actually used in cross origin resource sharing. Um, so let's say I make another request here. Hey, again, this time it'll be from me. You can see here we made a request with the method options, right? Right before I made the post request. So this is what cores is doing, right? What cores does is it takes options requests. Um, they're called pre-flight requests. And then it basically tells the requester what are what methods and what actions and headers are supported at this particular endpoint. Um, so you can see here our response headers where you are allowed to get, head, put, patch, post, and delete at this endpoint. Um, you're allowed to use the content type headers. And since this star right here is provided, what it means is that we are allowed to access this resource. If you can, you can read about it right here. Indicates so cores, what's that? Cores kind of like so cores runs the options on its own because like I we didn't we didn't write uh, an options request right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it handles the options request on its own. <clears throat> um, now there are ways of configuring cores. Oh, Alicia's gone too. 
whoops, I missed the messages. Um, yeah, so there's ways of configuring cores, right, uh, to the specifications that you want. Um, so you can only allow a particular origin or only some specific methods, but we didn't cover that in uh, this discussion. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess I have a quick question on like the um, like user credentials, especially yeah. like, I don't know how relevant this would be, but like, I know when we had to do in Firebase, all I use is like storing the u user ID and then like there's no encryption or anything. So how would like encryption work? Sure. So Firebase, when you're creating a user, um, it handles the creation of, well, it handles the storage of the user's information and the password. Um, it just basically takes it all out of your hands and it handles it on its own, right? Um, so what you have access to is the UID of them but you won't have access to everything else, right? The way that most passwords work is um, they aren't actually stored in a database at all. Their hash is. So when you enter your password, it runs through a particular hash function, um, which is then checked against the database. Um, usually these hash function functions are incredibly difficult to reverse engineer. So there's no, most of the time they can't be reverse engineered. So like there's no way that you could figure out the original password given a hash other than brute forcing every single possible password on that hash, which is an incredibly laborious process. All right, thank you for hanging out with us today, talking about backend development. There was a lot of material to go over in a very short amount of time. Um, you may have noticed we added an extra little endpoint here. Um, that's just if you wanted to demonstrate that you can actually still use the server as well, a web server. Um, but there's no way that we could really cover everything in backend development or provide a truly sufficient um, introduction to the backend uh, in just an hour. So hopefully this was insightful um, and got you more interested to dip your toes into backend development and see what it's like. Um, as always, this video will be available on YouTube. Um, also, if you want to check out just the textual adaptation of this, or not adaptation, the, uh, the readme for this particular lesson where we have all the resources and pretty much all the information that was kind of spewed out in this video, um, that's available on our GitHub. There will be a link in the description for that. Um, but other than that, thank you for joining us on this adventure. I think this is my last learning lab. Um, yeah, take it easy, stay healthy.